It's a good day. We want to welcome all of you, of course, those who are online. And uh, it is one of those moments where you think about going back. And I'm going to ask you to do this. You go back to the webpage. You go back and you look at some of the messages and hear them again and see how they all fit together. Because where we're at today is, is kind of like a combination of what has been shared in this series all the way through. And so as we dig into it, there's this, this idea of like, like Jesus as the gate, the good shepherd. We're going to go to scripture here in a minute, but when I started to think about this originally, it was like, well, this is a pretty obvious one. I mean, you know, we're going to talk about the gate. What does that mean? And I started kind of processing in my mind that the introduction Walking through something, I mean, that's a big deal, right? There was a wedding this weekend. Does anybody know about that? <laughs> there was a wedding this weekend, and I, it was in this room, actually, that, that I thought about introductions and walking through. In fact, I thought about this uh, back in the day when uh, our pastor, Matthew, um, was playing basketball at Lakeview, Pastor Amy. I used to do some introductions for them. Matthew, what was your number in high school? Number 31. And ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Matthew Trexler. And it's like number 31 in your program, but number one in your heart. You know, and then, then when the women's games would come out, Pastor Amy, she was part of the Twin Towers, the big introduction you know, like entering in, this idea of walking through. But last night, I mean, how amazing that as the wedding party's walking through, the voice of heaven actually introduced them, Jim Brunner. In fact, I, I think that's how, like, like I want to be introduced into heaven someday. When you're walking through the pearly gates, it's, it's Jim Brunner's voice. And now entering heaven... He's 5'10", well, maybe 5'8". I mean, whatever, but wouldn't that be amazing to walk through this, 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 this amazing entrance? And see, for me, I was almost like just skipping by that, like, you know, walking through this gate. What does that even mean? I mean, that's kind of a necessary thing we have to get into, but it's not. It's so much more than that. So as we dig into this, let's go to Scripture here and see what we see um, in John chapter 10, now this is so classic. If you've been to church for one minute, you probably read this multiple times. Therefore, Jesus said again, barely, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Now, really quick as we begin to read this, it's like, what is the I am? I am. Well, this is critical. The I, I am. This is Jesus saying something. Now, if we go back in context, we understand that it's like in, in that moment, there's a lot of people who don't really believe who he is or understand who he is. He has not risen from the dead at this point. I mean, this is going on where, where it's like, is he actually, you know, this amazing person? Because people understand in context, they, they know about other people. They know about this one guy that was like picked up in a flaming chariot and went straight to heaven. I mean, they know the stories. They know about the miraculous. But do they know that Jesus actually is God? So you see that I am coming through here. In fact, I would even dig a little bit deeper here. And we think about Jesus doing all the miracles. And, and we would tell you this, that Jesus never did a miracle to, to create this belief in him. All right? Jesus did miracles to establish his identity that he is God. In fact, I want to even take a little bit further and say to you, like, and I'm not sad about billboards or whatever, you know, but, but I see a billboard that says, you know, there's evidence that, you know, God exists or Jesus, and, which is great because I believe, you know, in all of that too, and I think the ark exists, and I'm all about all of it, okay? But at the epicenter of what we believe is not scientific proof or evidence. At the epicenter of what, we'll be, what we believe is by faith. By faith is at the epicenter of who we believe in. Love the science. Love all that stuff. Love the, that's great. That's good information. 
But at no point did Jesus said, I will prove to you enough. In fact, we get a chance to go see great paintings and we get a chance to go see great artwork. And there's this one famous painting where you see this guy named Thomas actually touching the hole in Jesus' side. Do you know what I'm talking about? We've seen that a thousand times. That never actually existed. It never says in Scripture that Thomas felt the nail holes. It says in Scripture that as Jesus revealed himself and invited him, Thomas stopped and said, no, I see and believe. Are we tracking? So culture is really good at kind of confusing some of the stuff here. But at the epicenter of what we believe is by faith. And so to walk through this thing is, is understanding that, that, yes, we can actually trust this person named Jesus. I am. So when I read that, it's like, I just can't skip over this. There's so much to this. All of you come before me are thieves and robbers. We'll get to that in a little bit. But the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Again, we see it. Whoever enters through me will be saved, will be. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life. And you know the rest of it. That you actually might have a life that you couldn't ever create or manufacture on your own. When it says life to the full, I remember as a kid thinking, it's like life to the full? What does that even mean? I, I'll tell you this. When I got in this Dodge Omni, now most of you don't even know what that is. Take like a tin can and put four wheels on it, all right? All right, and try to like push it down the road. Okay, I remember driving, you know, from this state called Michigan, just north of here. Okay, you eat, hey, I'm preaching, <laughs> pastor. I'm preaching. I'm ordained, I remember. <laughs> and I remember driving in, and this, this is what the last words from my home church were. And, and they loved me, and they cared about me, but they admonished me. And they said, now, try to make it through at least one semester. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was a grand expectation, you know, for me from my home church and family. It's like, it, could you make it through at least one semester in college? And for me, it's like, what is life to the full? I mean, as we dig into this, we begin to understand that as the gate that is actually this, this incredible moment that we enter from death to life that we actually, we saw in baptism where, where we walk into the presence of Jesus with Jesus. And now it's not just the end of the experience that we have as Christians, it's just literally the beginning. For me, it's like I, I thought that once you walk through the gates, it's like, well, that's it, you're done. I mean, you did that, check the box, it's moving on, now you can do what you want. Not true at all. It's the beginning. In fact, if we dig a little bit deeper, if we don't really respect the gate, how are we supposed to lead someone else through it? Amen. I would suggest that there's times in your life where you go back and, and you just reminisce. And there's nothing wrong with it. I do that all the time. In fact, this weekend was a wedding weekend. I, I was actually doing a wedding up in Port Huron, Michigan. And so I went to reminisce. Um, Reverend Canaan, I mean, I, would, I, I reminisced about Vassar Camp and going back, you know, and, and those moments that we had on that, to me, that sacred ground, you know, and where God met in so many ways. I, I went back to little spots while I was driving back between Port Huron and Marion, and, and I took a little detour, and I kind of drove through my own whole hometown, you know, just to reminisce on how God moved in this little Wesleyan church, like I was in a cornfield, and still in a cornfield. I don't care where it's located. It's the space where Jesus brought people together to, to, to invest in other people. It was a gate. My little tiny Wesleyan church was a gate. You don't even know where it's at. I mean, two people know where it's at. All right? One's sitting right there and one's right here. It's like, but to me, it was a gate. An opportunity 
to understand like what it meant to actually know Jesus Christ, but at the same time, help other people walk through the gate as well. See, the gate's not just for you. Your salvation, according to Dr. Mulholland, your, your salvation is also for the sake of another, someone else. So now the question is, are we walking anybody through the gate? So I, I'm thinking through this and digging through it, and, and I, a couple things came to my mind, a couple warning signs that I just want to throw out. And, and again, in my perspective, these are for me, and I'm just sharing them with you. The, what I was processing, and one warning sign I noticed about me is this. Knowledge leads to pride, while love leads to sacrifice. We are surrounded, which are beautiful places of knowledge. Love them to death. Appreciate I work for one. I mean, we get it, right? But knowledge is information. And that can be gleaned and Googled. While transformation, to truly understand something, means you have to suffer. Suffering opens the door to truth and understanding. And what love does, it leads to sacrifice. So while we have knowledge, I've noticed how knowledge can be an open door to pride. If I have more information than anybody else, then of course, you know, I have some influence or even power over them. What is love? Love is humility. Love means that you're giving everything that you have for someone else. In fact, as we're prepping for these you know, messages, these homilies for weddings, Pastor Matthew, you for your daughter, me for this dear friend of mine up in Port Huron. I mean, you're reading through scripture and talking about what love is and how it's patient and how it's kind and what they tell you to read, except for all of those things are expected of all of us. We're expected to have that kind of love that we seem to only reserve, you know, for weddings. And it's like, man, this impossible love and this love that lasts forever and it's a love that will be the best love that ever loved. And it's like, man, it's like, wow. It's like, what kind of love is this? It is the love that Jesus Christ has for each one of you and for me. And yes, it's impossible for you to mimic it unless you lose yourself in him. It's impossible for us to have that kind of love for anyone else, even ourselves, without his power in our life. What we notice when we're prepping for a wedding is like really at the epicenter of this union, which by the way is a modern miracle. It's a miracle, it's miraculous where two actually become one. Wow, that's, that's shocking. What we notice in that connection is, is a commitment. That actually the love and the connection and the desire is met by a commitment to stay connected. I've, I've made a decision. Where I've made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, in this context, I'm making a decision to walk with all of you in a community where we celebrate Jesus, and then when we're done celebrating Jesus in this room, which we do really well, I mean, you should hear it from the backside. It sounds really good. Then we go out and connect with as many people as we can outside of this room and help them walk through a door. And that door can be this door right here. It can be this, that door. It can be the door to your house. It can be the door to your car. It can be the door to a restaurant, even Starbucks. It can be any door. There's a lot of people getting saved at Starbucks, I noticed, over the years. <laughs> Any door. As long as Jesus is on the other side. The other thing I notice is this. Um, people love to fight over information while Jesus preached transformation. Once we're walking through the door, I want to have the theological debate. So those are super cool. Let's dig into it. But there's a lot of preference out there. 
on exactly what you should look like as a Christian and what church you should attend. I mean, really, at the epicenter of it, preferences are great, but they're not our platform. Don't ever make your preference your platform. Our platform is that Jesus Christ transforms a human being. Now, it may take a minute. It's taking a minute for you, Amante. I mean, it's taking a minute for me, Charlie. It's taking a minute for you, Matthew, Pastor Amy. I'm just offending the people I know that maybe we'll still have a relationship later. <laughs> Is it taking a minute for you to be transformed? Amen. I don't know that. You have to decide that. But the point is this. Is that let's not be all caught up in like fighting over our preference. What is our platform? Rather, who is our platform? That's Jesus Christ. And so as I'm digging through it, um, it's like, wow, Matthew, you set me up with some great, you know, context and scripture. I just decided to go through a couple more and start reading through them. It's like, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And then all of a sudden I'm reading that one. It's like, now I'm getting a little bit more convicted because at times, especially this time of the year, it's like, what do I hunger and thirst for? Now, where I was at on... Friday was outdoor. Now think about this for a minute. You're, you're outdoor in Michigan. It's about right at 78 degrees, perfect. The grass was cut. You could feel that morning breeze. You smell that fresh cut grass in August. And the only thing that came to my mind was football. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about when you can smell the grass? And then a coach will pick up a piece of grass and put it in their mouth. It's like, that's gross. No, that's good. In the Greek, it said, you know, I, don't know, I, I apologize. It was just a joke. J.K. LOL is super cool. As we're digging into it, it's like, man, I love that smell. It's like all of a sudden I recognize that. It's like, it smells like football. It's that time of the year. And, and I notice that it's like I hunger and thirst, you know, to get, you know, in the into the stadium because that, that mix of popcorn and grass and everything else is just like, to me, beautiful. In fact, I, I tried to make this cologne that I wanted to market to men. It was like, you, you can get football popcorn smell. You could get, you know, like dry grass smell or campfire. Those three, I, I thought that would sell. And every lady in the room was like, uh, I don't think so. It's like... Don't even try. And I think about all the things that I hunger and I thirst for in my life that seem so important to me. And I just want to know, it's like, am I hungering and thirsting for something that actually is eternal? I mean, how much do I actually love and value my relationship with Jesus Christ versus my my, my side passion for football. And I see this, and I, I recognize that as I walk through that door, this is what keeps me walking with him. And we're going to get that in a minute, but it's like thirst for this relationship. Can I, can I change the word, Pastor, and, say, and go from righteousness to relationship? I, I want to thirst and I want to hunger for this relationship. I, I want to thirst and hunger for this time to, to be together to worship. I want to thirst and hunger for community. I, I want this thing that, that really helps identify who I am in, in this context that I'm no longer living a life that's identified by me and my, and my will, but I am no longer mine, I'm yours. And, and I want to be known by you. And I want people to know that I'm a part of, of your body and I'm not gonna be satisfied with anything else. Even my job, my vocation, or talents or gifts. Because none of that will ever satisfy. Talk to someone who's been down the road for a while. I do all the time. And I, I talk to them and, and, and what is it that brings you that satisfaction? 
I'm lucky enough to have family members. And when I talk to my father-in-law, Jim, for me, I'll talk to him at length about this stuff. And we'll go back and reminisce about some things. And he was telling me about the story where it's like, you know, when, when we first got to Haiti and we had to take the donkey up the side of this hill and, and it was in the middle of the night. And, and I've told you these stories before about him. You know, and, and it's like a donkey on the side of the hill in modern times. Like, what? Yeah, this wasn't like in 1850. This is just a minute ago. And, and, and then when you finally got to that church on this mountaintop where, a, you know, a car wouldn't go and, you know, where did you sleep? At the Holiday Inn Express? It's like, well, on a, a bench in the church where they had to put two benches together so that they'd stay above the rats. And we're talking about these stories, but I noticed something about him. The story isn't about how cool the donkey was or the bench, but it was a desire, a thirst to know Jesus and him to be known by someone else, to open the door. The donkey and the bench, they were part of the stories. But the passion, the thirst, was to proclaim that Jesus Christ is for all who believe. All who believe. So I'm going through this, and I would just say to you, I see this in Colossians, set your minds on things that are above. I, this is just, again, to, to say keep doing that. As you're walking through, the, keep setting your minds, keep setting your hopes on things that aren't here. They're not things that are here. Don't get discouraged by what you see on social media. In fact, try to ignore most of it. Okay, unless it's from the River Church on Facebook, then, you know, uh, you know whatever. Celebrating baptisms. But you walk through that door, don't turn around and look back from where you came. Look straight ahead to where you're going where he's leading, where he's leading you. So, here we go. We don't seek behavioral modification when we walk through that door. We seek life change, right? That's what I love about this church. Come as you are. It's Jesus Christ that changes us. Is Jesus and his life in us that will draw people. It's not about behavioral modification. We want life change. Now, I'm digging through this, and, and he goes, I want you to talk about the gate, but also about the shepherd, the good shepherd. And so I'm digging through that, and it's like, well, yeah, you know, if, if we keep on going in, in John, we see this, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The iron hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Before I go on, it's like, whoa, uh, the good shepherd lays down his life. I mean, we know who that is. Who's the hired hand in this story? Well, I don't want to be the hired hand. Do I, do I want to be a person that when it gets tough, when it gets difficult, I abandon everybody? Well, we do know something to be true here. There is a good shepherd, and there's some shepherds who are not good. And you got to know the difference. What's the difference between a good shepherd and not a good shepherd? I don't want to focus. I'm going to spend no time talking about a bad shepherd because you already know what that's like. There's not one person in this room who's not suffered. Not one. We have all suffered. Let's talk about what, who. Let's talk about the good. So as I go a little bit deeper, the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's hired. A hired hand. All right? You're not walking through the gate to connect with somebody who's going to run at the first sign of issues or problems. And you didn't walk into a church that's going to run if you carry some of those problems here. That's not this church. Just so you know. See this. Lessons I learned. Number one, understanding God's heart will either drive you closer to him or it will drive you away. 
the, de- the, de- the deeper you dig in Jesus Christ and understanding who he is, the deeper that you go in understanding him, all of a sudden you'll see who he really is. I believe that it'll draw you deeper in the relationship. I believe you'll, you'll see him and you'll recognize, I want more of that. However, I'm just going to be honest with you at the same time. As you're seeing who he really is, you're also seeing who you really are. And that is a challenge for all of us. We walk through the gate in this relationship that we call salvation and become um, a part of the body of the family of God. We, We now have a relationship with him. And now is the process of becoming more like him and dying to us. It's not an easy process I am admitting it in front of y'all. And yet the more I understand him, the more I realize that he is God and that I am not. And neither are you. Or whoever's in office. Whoever who's my leader, whoever, whatever. So the more you know and recognize who he is, the more that you really clearly see him, there's a decision that has to be made. Am I willing to continually die to myself so that I can understand him more. We would say this in the classic sense, more of him and less of me. More of him and less of me. That is a process that we have to embrace. It goes back to the commitment. The commitment that we made because there's going to be times where the feeling just isn't there. It's just not there where it's like, oh, I cannot wait to die to myself. I cannot wait to give that up. Oh, that's so easy. There's going to be things that you're going to have to lay down at his feet that you don't want to give up if you want to know him more. And that's true for all of us. It's a part of the relationship. I also see this. You can impress somebody from a distance but you can only impact someone up close. I notice, again, going back to what I said before, it's like we become addicted to social media where we can paint ourselves any kind of picture we want, present ourselves out there. I mean, you can't believe hardly anything you see in a magazine because it's been photoshopped. I mean, it's like we can make anything up that we want and just throw it out there from a distance but not get close to anybody. And then that is now our identity. It's not really who we are. What he wants for you is a relationship that's so close that he can smell you. Now, that's not super popular anymore. But I remember clearly, I remember clearly a conversation with somebody who was much older and wiser who told me clearly, don't trust the person unless you can smell them. I want you to get that close. Not easy to do. Because I'm kind of concerned on how I smell. (laughs) Deeper in scripture, it talks about this sweet and pleasing aroma. This aroma that, that that will celebrate who God is and people will be drawn to it, but others will be driven away. Because to some, that aroma smells like life, and to others, it smells like death. And that is that major conflict that we're in the middle of is who is God? Who is really in control of my life? Because for me, for a little while, my relationship with God was I walked through the door, I went through that gate, I entered that relationship, and then it's kind of where I hung out. Until people said, you have to keep moving. It was really comfortable staying really tight at the beginning being a new Christian, not much was expected. Not much was demanded. It, it, it was kind of safe. But how terrible is that in our context? I have a grandson, little Theo. He's a really cool little bro. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. I think he's amazing. 16 months old. But what we celebrate is his growth. I mean... You know, a couple months ago, it was boom. You know, that was, that was a good development. 
Now he's saying people's names. He makes these sounds with his lips. He runs around in circles. I mean, he does all the miraculous. When I went to visit him, he lives in another country, so I, mean, I had to fly to Barcelona, Spain, and, and then drive into France. And when I'm hanging out with him, it's like all I wanted to do for 10 days is just be with Theo and go to a, a little tiny slide that was like not that big a deal. Now, before Theo was born, it's like I wanted to go over there and see the Eiffel Tower and go see this and go see the Louvre and see Mount St. Michel. I mean, I wanted to see all some amazing sights, and I wanted to go see things that were spectacular. But when Theo entered the picture, I don't even care about sightseeing. I just wanted to find a little tiny park with a little tiny slide and just watch him grow. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. A bunch of you know exactly what I'm saying. I just wanted to see him grow. That's normal, natural. I think what he wants is to see you grow, but it's gonna cost you something to grow. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you something. There is a price to pay. It's what is normal. It's what's natural. But it's not always easy. And then we see this. A Christian who believes in what is right is not the same thing as a Christian who's doing what is right. I'm sorry. that I, This is in my notes. This is, I, if this is for you, that's, your, that's between you and God. I'm just saying this is very convicting to me. Just knowing what is right with my good shepherd is not the same thing as doing what is right. Because again, doing what is right might cost you. But really in the end, what does it cost? If your passion and the one you choose to impress, his name is Jesus. Again, I go back to what we said at the beginning. You know, we have this grand introduction. And in my head, I'm thinking that wouldn't it be cool again? I told you this is the beginning of the message to be introduced into heaven. Jim Brunner's like, now, introducing, did a decent job. Wasn't very good in high school football, but he loved me and trusted me. Can you imagine? What, what that relationship will be when you and I see him face to face, and we will. And he's going to want to know how well you stained your front porch or your house or how many you know, great jobs you had or what. Really, at the end of the day, did you do what was right in my eyes? What relationships did you establish? What did you sacrifice? Because I think this is true. Number four, Jesus came and walked with people. He didn't just tell them what direction to go. This is a shepherd that I want to follow. I want to follow the shepherd that's walking with me through all of it. I want to be a part of the shepherd who's like leading me down the, the weird path or up the mountainside or when it's not very easy to follow. And I know that he's right there, that I can trust him. Jesus is not the shepherd that gets you in the door and says, now it's your job to go do that. I'm hanging back here. This is what you need to do. And that's where you need to go. That's not the shepherd that I know. The shepherd I know says, come follow me as I go. I know it's going to be tough talking to that person. It's okay. Just follow me because I want to know them too. I know it's not going to be easy to say no to that or, or, or say yes to this or whatever it might be. He's not telling you what to do. He's showing you how to do it. And he's walking with you all the way. So if you don't know the shepherd that I'm describing, here it is in Scripture. He's a shepherd that won't leave you nor forsake you, that loves you unconditionally, that will walk with you through the hard times. And honestly, some of the most difficult times that you'll walk through, the more you know him, the more you'll recognize he's been with you the entire time. He's walking with you through cancer. He's walking with you through hurt, through breakup, through divorce, through suffering, through family stuff that nobody else knows about but you do. 
He's walking with you before, during, and after the funeral. He's walking with you through all of this because that's the kind of shepherd he is. He's not just going to open the door. He's going to open the door and walk with you to the very end. So could we possibly open the door to another? Could the result of our relationship with this amazing shepherd mean that we want to open doors? That's what I want you to think about. And know that you're not alone in any of it. Father, I just pray, God, that you would reveal yourself in a new and a fresh way to us. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, can I just pray over you right now? And if you want to raise your hand that you have something that's so difficult and you don't see an option and you just want special prayer, you can do that now. I'm just going to pray for you. Father, for people who are going through things right now that they just don't see what's next. And it's not that easy to think through it. I pray your power and your presence over them now, over us now, to trust you, our good shepherd, to walk with you. Know that you are God. In your name we pray. Amen.